In later life, we see repetitions and continuations of issues introduced earlier in the life cycle. We're always addressing core questions of who am I now and what is my role in life? And so this morning, I pose the question of what does it mean to live on the other side of excellence? Marge Stradley wrote in her article, What is a Crone? That nowadays, being an old woman is treated as something to be ashamed of. Women dye their hair, have facelifts, and falsify their age, trying to be forever young. Not this old woman, she says, although I do admit to dyeing my hair as the mood strikes me. I am proud of my status as a crone. Being called a crone should be an earned title. She says, as my drumming circle sang to me, old and strong, she goes on and on like the mountain. Crones are walking, talking history books. Women my age have lived through the Depression and World War II. We have seen life and death many times. We are weathered baskets, as a poster I once saw calls us. We are physically weaker in body, and sometimes we even use a cane, but we are wealthy in wisdom, in stories, and in history. So what does it mean to live as an elder, to try to claim the life of wisdom and wealth of knowledge past 60 or 70? Even if 60 is the new 30, how many can keep up with that? And for how long? No matter how many drugs you take, no matter how many surgeries you have, how many exercise classes you go to, or what your diet is, eventually, eventually the excellence of our body does soften. Eventually our society and our place in it begins to become unclear. Though we may see excellence as our golden days, our golden years, it's still true, according to my father-in-law, who retired a few years ago, that it's kind of hard to get younger people to listen to you once you pass a certain age. They seem to think they have all the answers. Looking at the issue of developmental tasks through the lens of psychology, we come to the works of Eric Erickson, who was pondering what are the tasks of the latter parts of life. Eric Erickson, who was a neo-Freudian in the first part of the 20th century before the field of gerontology was developed, was focused on ego development. And as I revisited my adult development textbooks from my grad school days, I found a summary of Erickson's theories and the reminder that the primary task in later life, psychologically speaking, is the task or the tension between ego integrity and despair. He defines integrity as an acceptance of one's life cycle, a realization that one did what one could, and an appreciation for others in our lives and recognition that they also did and are doing the best that they can. Successful ego integration means that we develop a sense of connectedness with others, both living and dead, defining our place in history as both a descendant and as, as an ancestor. Now, the other end of this tension is despair. And he clarifies healthy despair versus malignant despair. I never thought that despair could possibly be healthy. But he says, it's normal to have concern for future, future generations. Despair can lead to volunteerism, saying, what is the world coming to? I need to do something. And this can happen in later life. But malignant despair leads to a focus only on what is wrong with your life, to bitterness, to being cheated, constantly angry at the world. And he cautions that too little despair can lead to over-trusting. The ideal outcome 
of this developmental phase, according to him, is a preponderance of integrity tinged with realistic despair. A preponderance of integrity tinged with realistic despair, which he says leads ultimately to wisdom. So this, from a psychological perspective, is the developmental task of those of us later in life, living in that tension and working towards wisdom. Mary Pfeiffer, a psychologist and author who also wrote Reviving Ophelia, which some of you may have heard of, talked about the tasks of, of older adulthood in her book, Na Another Country, Navigating the Emotional Terrain of Our Elders. She said, when I turned 50, I invented a mnemonic device to help me make good decisions about time. I decided I needed five things in my life. Respect, relationships, results, relaxation, and realization. Since then, she says, I have tried to use the five R's to budget my time. And then, thinking about resilient old people, I realized that my mnemonic device could be used to describe their needs as well as my own. We humans actually have a fairly small and elemental set of needs. We want to be loved and respected and useful. We want to have fun and we want to develop our talents. The resilient old develop relationships, ways to be useful to their communities, ways to relax, ways to still develop their potential, and ways to feel respected. Now that's the psychological side of things in terms of development in later life. What about spiritually? Well, when Fred and I first started framing this conversation, the image that came to us or the language come, came to us from the Hindu tradition, which identifies four life stages or ashramas, each about 25 years in length. And according to one text, the perennial psychology of the Bhagavad Gita, they're described this way. The first is called Brahmakarya, the first 25 years, and it covers those first 25 years which, which should be devoted to study, discipline, and self-transformation. The next 25, from 25 to 50 roughly, Grihatsa, is the house, householder's life, spent skillfully and selflessly carrying on one's duties towards family and society. The third stage, Vanaprastha, is retirement. And it consists of preparing oneself for renouncing the world and cultivating the courage to attain the goal of life. In the fourth and last stage, sannyasa, one develops a completely detached attitude and establishes him or herself in the knowledge of the pure self. The final goal is renunciation and detachment. Yet, the author reminds us, every effort in this process is aimed to organize our internal lives so that we can become more useful and helpful to others. So even detachment is a useful tool in development and aging. Our guided meditation this morning was my take on the story of Jacob wrestling with an angel in the Hebrew scriptures. And the process of detachment, of letting go, of sending all of those things about us in our lives that have identified us for most of our lives across the river, sending those things ahead of us, our wealth, our relationships, our families, our possessions, to discover something new, something ever new about us, something deeper and true. 